If the season started today, who would start in the new look secondary for Tennessee? If the season started today, I think a lot of you guys would be upset, but the season doesn't start today. We'll talk Tennessee secondary here on a Tuesday at Lockdown Vols. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Locked On Balls, your Tuesday morning edition. I am Eric Kane. We are a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every single day. Big shout out to FanDuel Sportsbook for being a part of the show. Visit FanDuel.com to make every moment more. Again, that is FanDuel Sportsbook, America's number one sportsbook. Got a fun show coming up today. A lot of information uh, to come. We're going to take a look at the secondary. Um, we know that it's going to be brand new, but midway through fall camp, with kickoff for the season two and a half weeks away, where exactly are we in the secondary? What answers have we found, if any? We'll discuss uh, Tennessee secondary, and we'll get um, – we'll hit my microphone. We will uh, hear from uh, Willie Martinez, who's Tennessee's defensive backs coach, along with Tim Banks, obviously the coordinator, in segment number one. Update on Will Brooks as well, former um, – well, not a former. He's still a walk-on. And uh, Boo Carter, the true freshman in segment number one. Tennessee comes in at number 15 in the Associated Press poll. The debut poll is that too high, too low, or just about right? And then plenty of your mailback questions in segment number three. You can watch us, listen to us, download us, subscribe to us, all that and more, wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, on Locked On Vols YouTube channel. Um, got that uh, Instagram account, putting out reels daily over at Locked On Vols. Give that a follow as well. Okay, so the secondary. Uh, we know that Jordan Thomas, of course, is lost for the season, and that's unfortunate because I truly do believe that he's a decent player. He's a pretty good player, but he can never stay healthy enough to prove it, and he was going to get a shot this year to start, and, uh, of course, he went down with a non-contact injury the second day of fall camp, and, man, that's just uh, that, or the you know, a couple days into fall camp, and it's, uh, it's really, really unfortunate because, uh, again, I think that he's a pretty good player that could help um, if he ever got that opportunity. So, Boo Carter at the star position. If the season started the day, would Boo Carter be starting at the star? The answer is no. It would be Christian Harrison. Christian Harrison, along with um, you know, Jordan Thomas and Boo Carter, you know, worked at the star position to begin the year. Thomas is no longer in there, and so it's Boo Carter and Christian Harrison battling it out right now. And, and sure, there's two and a half weeks left, and, and we'll see if Boo Carter can eventually take it over or if he will before the season opener. But if the season started the day, it would be Christian Harrison at the star position. Well, we know Ricky Gibson. We know that Jermon McCoy, the transfer from um, Oregon State, are going to be your starting cornerbacks. We know Andre Turrentine is going to be one of your starting safeties. But who's that other safety going to be? Is it going to be the MTSU transfer, Jacoby Thomas? Is it going to be a sophomore in John Slaughter? Or is it going to be the veteran, the walk-on, once upon a time walk-on? I don't know if you can call him a walk-on anymore if he's been in the program for five years, but Will Brooks. If the season started today, it would be Will Brooks. But my hope and what I think is actually going to happen is for the first time under Tim Banks and Willie Martinez, they truly will have a rotation at the safety position. I think that Will Brooks is going to play. I think that Jacoby Thomas is going to play. I think that John Slaughter will even play. They're rotating in practice right now. Which one of them is going to take control of that spot and run with it? I don't know. We'll have to see. Will it happen before the season opener? I don't know. We'll have to see. But if the season started today, your starter of safety would be Will Brooks. And I know that upsets a whole lot of fans because they say, well, this is year four. How in the world can a former walk-on safety uh, be in the starting five? I I hear, I hear that. I hear that argument. Um, so we ask a lot of questions to Willie Martinez, who spoke to the media on um, on Monday, and here's what he had to say about Will Brooks. About two minutes worth. Basically, he trusts him. He trusts him an awful lot. And the back half of this question is: By playing special teams earlier in his career, did he see those skill sets translating the defense for Will Brooks? Here's Tennessee defensive back coach. Willie Martinez on veteran Will Brooks. Uh, his preparation, uh, you know, obviously he's an everyday, consistent um, player that's uh, very detailed about uh, whether it's in meetings, whether we're off the field, whether even if we're, you know what I mean, taking a day off, you know what I mean? He's, uh, he's somebody that we're leaning on for leadership uh, because he's been here for a long time and has done it the right way. Um, obviously his teammates respect him tremendously and uh, – He's been very consistent. You know, that's that's the best thing I can say about Will. Uh, there's no really up and down. Um, 
and the, and I, like I said, the players are being led the right way. We're the back end, right? We deal with space. What better example if you're doing it on special teams? I'm telling you, my entire career, um, the great players that I've been I've been very blessed to be a part of in their lives were great special teams players. I mean, really, in space. So anytime the guy's making consistently plays in space, um, doesn't matter what 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 teams he's on. Uh, it's gonna. It's got transferable skills to play offense and defense. And for us, you know, for most of it's all defense, right? Some of the same terminology is on special teams. It's on on uh, and he, him being a smart player, translating that to defense. Um, it's always been simple for Will, and uh, again, consistent. He's he's a consistent guy. You can count on every day, every drill. Um, I just heard him, like I, I just said a little while ago, I can't get a word in, especially if Will Brooks, he's in my pod and these special team groups, you know, obviously we got eight to 10 guys and, and uh, I want to go correct the guy and Will's already beat me there, you know, and, and sometimes he says it better than I do, you know, from a standpoint of the personality because I, you know, I, he, he keeps me in check myself, you know, about not losing it uh, when you're trying to correct somebody. So um, you saw it from the beginning because again, he showed he play he made some plays in space and then okay you you watch him in the meeting room and and gosh he's all over the scheme he understands it uh, um, and you knew that that um, he was going to have success here okay so we knew this about Tim Banks and that was Willie Martinez right there we know this already they like veterans they like playing guys whom they can trust and there's nothing wrong with that I mean if you trust that the guy's going to be in position to make the play then you have faith to put him out there. If he's the best option to be in position to make the play, and you know, will he make the play is another question. But if you're not even in position to make the play, then you can't. You're not trusted to be out there. Um, I mean, I, I understand it from their perspective. Now, is that going to be enough? Is that the best option? Would Jacoby Thomas give you a better option out there to where, sure, maybe he has an MA at one point, but you know, four out of five times he's going to be in the right spot every single time. But what if that MA miss assignment? gives up a touchdown. I don't know. I'm not a coach. You know, same with John Slaughter. Now, again, I truly do believe that there's going to be a rotation of safety this year for the first time under under this regime um, because I don't think there's a clear-cut starter. But you heard it right there. There's a ton that they like about Will Brooks, and that is all fine and dandy. That's great. And I'm rooting for Will Brooks. I think it's a great story. I think it's awesome. You know, but at the end of the day, you got to go out there and produce. If Will Brooks is out there producing, that's awesome. If he's not, then they better be, you know, if he's the starter, I don't know if he is or not, but if he's the starter, they better be willing to say, okay, Jacoby Thomas, get in there. Okay, John Slaughter, get in there. Because that is something we haven't seen this coaching staff do in, in quite some time, right? That, that we, we haven't seen this coaching staff do that at the safety position. Saw the cornerbacks a little bit with William Martinez last year, um, though there were some injuries there, but not a safety. So TBD, uh, there's still a lot more to go in camp, but anyway, you want to you want to phrase it, Will Brooks he is going to play this year. Will he be a starter? I don't know, but he's going to be in that rotation. Let's go back to the star position, Boo Carter. Willie Martinez was asked about Boo Carter, and I love his answer here. Really, really genuine. Give this a listen. Willie Martinez on true freshman, Boo Carter. Man, he's a really good player. The guy is so talented, you know? I mean, really, I mean, he's very competitive, um, uh, and I just said it. He's very athletic, so he's versatile. I mean, uh, you know, Boo can play a lot of positions. You know, we just assume we're just putting him right in a position where it makes where you have to make plays. I mean, you got to be a really good at star. You know, there, those are the position in our defense that schematically he's going to be involved almost in every play. And um, start off by his athleticism, his competitiveness, his love for the game. You can see it uh, both on and off the field, and uh, uh, and, he's, and it's great to have it because he's going to compete on every play. So he's a really, really good player. He's got a skill set. You know, we asked the star position to do an awful lot, and that's why they moved him there. That's awesome. I think uh, from a fan base perspective, we are super, super excited to see Boo Carter play. Again, the question is, w will he start? I, I don't know. I think eventually he will. If it's not week one, week two, we, we know whatever it is. Uh, but I do think he's going to play. Now, something I was going back and forth with a little bit with Austin Price on the VolQuest podcast uh, today's episode, I think. You know, I threw out the scenario like, hey, it's UT Chattanooga. I could see them starting Will Brooks. I could see them starting Boo, uh, I could see them starting Christian Harrison against UT Chattanooga and playing the other guys and getting them a ton of snaps and then rolling on to your, to, to your real season, essentially. 
um, against NC State the next week. And then AP responded, you know, if they're afraid to start Boo Carter against UT Chat, then they're going to be afraid to start him against NC State. I get all that. I think where I'm coming from in this conversation, that brings me back to my point here is, and I mean no disrespect to UT Chad Nougat, is what it is. You come here, you get a check, you get that tail whooped, right? Georgia State ruined that philosophy a couple years ago, but this team is 20 times more talented and deeper and better and better coached than that team that lost to Georgia State a few weeks ago. But my point is, again, all due respect, there's a lot of guys that grew up being Tennessee fans and from this area that play for UT Chattanooga, but it is what it is. You come here, get that tail whooped. You treat that like a scrimmage. Yeah, sure, it's game day. The whole week's different. The atmosphere's different. I understand all that, so it's not a true scrimmage, but you treat that like a scrimmage. So you're going to scrimmage on Thursday. You're going to have one more scrimmage of fall camp. I would treat the UTC game as a scrimmage. So that means if you want to start Christian Harrison, Will Brooks, you know, whomever, it's a scrimmage, right? I mean, I would treat that as the final thing to fall camp. That's just me. But, of course, I don't make $9 million a year. I'm not a football coach. Um, any way you want to spend it, I think eventually Boo Carter is going to be your starting nickelback. And I think that's going to be the be best for the team. Eventually, I do think that maybe, you know, hopefully somebody will step in um, that's maybe a little bit more athletic, maybe has a little bit more playmaking ability to start opposite of Andre Turrentine at safety. But here's the thing you got to understand as a fan base. And if you if you didn't get that from Willie Martinez earlier in the segment, I'm not sure you'll get it. Will Brooks is going to play. Will Brooks deserves to play from his makeup, from knowing the playbook, from being in the right place at the right time, uh, from a depth perspective. He might not start, but Will Brooks is going to play football in this secondary. So... I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, but it just it's how it's gonna work, right? Um, and then we'll see if we'll see if he can make some plays. Um, whoever's back there, we'll see if they can make the plays. But I just hope, and, and I'll end on this, it's something that we haven't seen in the safety position a lot of times. I mean, sometimes football players get beat. It's part of the game, right? But if you get beat, can you make a change? Will you put somebody else in there to get another look? I think this year you're gonna see that, you know, that 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 hand be forced. Whereas last year and the year before that and the year before that. You never saw that. So that's a look at the secondary, a little bit update there uh, from Willie Martinez. The emphasis at Tennessee fall camp on Monday was on the Tennessee secondary. All right, when we come back, we will take a look at Tennessee and the Associated Press Bowl, the first edition of this year. That's coming up next. We continue on here on a Tuesday edition of Locked On Ball. Stay tuned. I want to say about our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. I love sports. I love them so much I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer and fewer games. The sports aren't sporting like we want them to. Over at FanDuel, let's me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open up the app, dream up some bets anytime that I am in the mood. And football season is right around the corner. Can't wait for that. There's going to be so many different options there. You can get those futures in right now over at FanDuel.com as well. Because the rest of August, all customers, not new customers, not existing customers, every single customer, with, a, with an account over at FanDuel, is going to get a daily boost or a bonus. A daily boost or a bonus to bet on the spreads, bet on the money line, the run line, uh, point total, whatever the case is. That's something for everybody every day, all summer long, a daily boost or a bonus. So go over to FanDuel.com, start making the most out of your summer, start making the most out of the last bit of summer here in the August month. FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. It's where you make every moment more. FanDuel.com, FanDuel.com. All right, Tennessee voted number 15 in the first edition of the Associated Press Bowl, the AP poll, and this is the one that I pay attention to. Um, again, like I said last week when we kind of went over, there's going to be a lot of parallels, a lot of similarities in this segment and the one last week dissecting the coaches poll. Um, again, Tennessee was preseason ranked 15th in the coaches poll. Tennessee's preseason ranked 15th in the AP poll. Um, there's a lot of idiots, a lot of idiots in the media. Hey, I can say that my peers, a lot of idiots nationwide in the media that don't know how to vote on this stuff. Um, but I'll take those idiots, then coaches that don't pay attention or SIDs that don't pay attention to outside of your school or SIDs that will vote their team higher than way more than they should be because they're very much biased. The AP polls, what I pay attention to, of course, until the college football playoff rankings come out, uh, at the beginning of November. So, um, looking forward to that, but we got a lot to get into, or we got a lot of time between now and then. Tennessee enters the year, ranked inside the top 25 at number 15. Is that too high? Is that too low? Or is that just about right? I, again, I think it's just about right. I think Tennessee anywhere from 12 to 16 is about where it should be. So 15, I have no, no issue about it whatsoever. Tennessee's got four opponents on its schedule ranked inside the top 25. Oklahoma is right behind Tennessee at number 16. North Carolina State, NC State is at 25. Georgia's at number one. 
Alabama is at number five. Tennessee finished at number 17 in the AP last year after the win over the win over uh, Iowa, 35 nothing in the Citrus Bowl, finishing nine and four. Uh, Tennessee again preseason ranked number 15. If anybody's wondering, that top 10, the top five is Georgia at the top, Ohio State at two, Oregon at three, Texas at number four, Alabama at number five. So in the top five, the SEC has one, two, three. Ole Miss at number six. Ole Miss at number six to begin the year. That is interesting. Notre Dame at seven, Penn State at eight, Michigan at nine, Florida State at number 10. Missouri coming in just outside the top 10 at number 11. That's the fifth SEC team that's ranked. Utah at 12, LSU at 13. Still so overrated. LSU is going to finish eight and four. LSU is very much overrated in my opinion. Um, you lose a Heisman Trophy winner. You lose some first-round wide receivers in consecutive years. You've got two great offensive tackles. I will give you that. Uh, but the defense couldn't stop a cold last year, and Harold Perkins just still hasn't figured out how to use them. Again, I think LSU, though Garrett Nussmeyer I think is going to be a good player, I think LSU is so overranked this offseason. It's not even funny. But they come in here ranked right number 13 to begin the season. That is the sixth SEC team that's ranked. Clemson is at number 14, which I think Tennessee should be in front of uh, Clemson. Um, Tennessee's at 15, Oklahoma's at 16. Then you got Oklahoma State, Kansas State, Miami, uh, 17 through 20, 17 through 19. Texas A&M is at number 20. And again, NC State's at 24. No other SEC team is ranked after A&M at 20. So, uh, that's kind of, kind of where it is. Um, again, I think LSU should be behind Tennessee. I think Tennessee, honestly, according to this AP poll, I think Tennessee should be 13. LSU should be 14. And Clemson should be 15. It's kind of how I would uh, how I would spin it there, um, but that is just me. Is Ole Miss ranked too high? Ole Miss at number six. Ole Miss is the offseason darling, 100. percent And we're gonna see. Is Lane Kiffin's philosophy of, of literally rebuilding the nucleus of your team via the transfer portal every single offseason? Does it pay dividends? Does it prove? that you can go to the college football playoff. We're going to find out. It's either going to be really, really good, or it's going to be a disaster. And I'm intrigued to see what the leadership of that locker room looks like when adversities hit. I don't know who the leader is. I, I don't follow the team, okay, so I don't know the players. I'm not saying they don't have leaders. I just I don't know who the leaders are of that football team. Jackson Dart's the quarterback. I know that. I would imagine quarterback's typically a leader of a football team. When adversity hits, what's Ole Miss look like? I, I'm intrigued. What does Alabama look like with the new look offense? Everybody thinks – that Alabama's offense is going to take a step in the right direction under Jalen Milrow with Kellen DeBoer, you know, bringing in his scheme. Texas, everybody's saying that Alabama or Georgia and Texas could potentially square off three times, three times in a season. Of course, they play uh, one another. I think is it week two or week three of the season, and then they can meet in the SEC championship game, and then they can meet in the national championship game in the college football playoff. Wouldn't that be something to see two teams square off three different times in a season? to determine who the national champion is going to be. Everybody's high on Oregon right now. Ohio State, will that have enough juice um, offensively to live up to that number two ranking? We'll see. Uh, Notre Dame, I think, is always overranked. It's their number seven. Penn State had a good year last year, but I think it's got one of the most overrated coaches in college football. Michigan, the national champion of last year, begins the season ranked at number nine. Can it block out all the noise in the offseason and um, you know produce another – college football playoff top season. I think that it's certainly talented enough. It's got an easy schedule and it's got Oregon earlier in the year, but it's got a very, very easy schedule. So I think that, um, I think that it can, I don't know. I think Tennessee here at number 15 is about right. Again, the only, the only thing I would flip is I would have Tennessee ahead of LSU and Clemson. I understand Missouri being ranked ahead of Tennessee. Um, they're at number 11. I'm actually surprised Missouri didn't crack the top 10, to be honest with you. I'm not, I don't think Missouri is going to be fantastic, but I think they're going to be fine. And I think when you look back at what they, what they return, it's easy to see why. So Tennessee begins the season right. Number 15 in the AP poll. Is that too high? Is that too low? Or is that just about right? The question is for you at underscore Kaner and at locked on balls. Hey, when we come back, you guys have so many questions, some good questions this week. We're going to answer those when we return right here on a Tuesday. Lockdown Ball. Stay tuned. Passion, drive, patience. The formula for winning championships is what also keeps your ride or die alive. 
eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and leveled up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust skits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. I lost my spot in the script. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money is bad. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber not cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to make your car the mvp and bring home huge wins keep your ride or die alive today at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply ebay guarantee fit only available to u.s customers okay so we have questions for you guys that submitted them in here for the mailbag edition of the show and i'm going to try to answer as many as i possibly can uh first we'll go over to the youtube channel We'll start with S. Grubbs, 1999. Scale of 1 to 10, will Nico break the passing record for a first-year full-time starter, I would assume in program history, or will he turn into a more of a running quarterback like against Iowa? And will Pierce break the career sack record? I think he needs 10. Um, i got to be honest with you, I don't have the sack numbers in front of me. I was focused on the quarterback part of this question, so I do apologize. Um, we'll see. I know... Pierce ended last year, I want to say, with 10 and a half. Derek Barnett holds the uh, holds the record. I would, I would have assumed that he's well more than 10 past Pierce so far, but uh, we'll see. I, I'll come back and answer that later. But as far as the full-time starter, um, skill 1 to 10, will Nico break the passing record for a full-time starter um, in program history? Well, I think it's – what do you deem as a full-time starter? I went back and looked, and I actually had a file here, and – I didn't go back to, uh, way early on because, of course, the game has changed and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of passing yards, you know, prior to where we are right now. Um, and, and like, if you're a freshman, do you get your toes wet? You're not a full-time starter. What if you start the season then get hurt and miss significant portion of the season? You're technically not a full-time starter. So I went back and and, and pulled out some years, and you can be the judge if they're considered full-time starters for the first year or not, but. Joe Milton last year, first time being a full-time starter for Tennessee. Okay, 2021, he started the season, but then he got hurt. He threw for 2,813 yards. I think Nico can surpass that. I do. Hendon Hooker in 2022, not 2021, when he came on for Joe Milton, played nearly the full season. I'm counting 2022 because he bookend as the starting quarterback for Tennessee. He threw for 3,135 yards. That's a lot of yards. Will Nico throw more than that? His first year as a full-time starter? I don't know. I'll probably say no. But 3,100-plus is a lot of yards. Uh, Jerry Garantano, his first year as a full-time starter in 2018, he threw for 1,907 yards. Yeah, take the over. Hammer the over. Dobbs in 2015. Again, Dobbs played a little bit in 2014, but first year as a true starter in 2015, he threw for 2,291 yards. I'll hammer the over there. Of course, Dobbs threw for a ton more the next year. Um, Tyler Bray who threw for a significant amount more in 2012. In 2011, he threw for 1,983 yards. Hammer the over. I think he threw for like 3,600 yards in 2012. And then uh, Jonathan Crompton was very much on Joe Milton's you know par there. First year as a true starter for Lane Kiffin in 2009, 2,800 yards. I would take the over. So I think it's somewhere between Milton in 2023 and Hendon in 2022. Somewhere between 2,813 yards and 3,135 yards. That is what I think Nico can throw for this year. A uh, Vols fan in Georgia. We've seen Nico target tight ends in his five games last year. That said, how important is tight end group in the red zone? We haven't heard much about Holden Stays. What will his role be there as well? Yeah, Holden Stays is going to play. Miles Kitzelman, Holden Stays, and Ethan Davis are going to split the tight end duties, in my opinion. I think for the first time under the Josh Hopper regime, they're going to actually play three tight ends. And because they have three, to answer your question, in the red zone, absolutely. They have tried to incorporate more tight ends in red zone formations over the course of the first three years, but I can count on one hand how many times they actually have multiple tight ends on the field at the same time. They've tried it, they just didn't have the luxury to do it often. Uh, Kentucky 2021 comes to mind. Um, I want to say Alabama 2022 comes to mind. There's been a couple different times they've had multiple tight ends on the field, but I do think, especially in the red zone, they absolutely will. Good question there. Uh, David says, or he asks, can UT's coaches develop exercise and diet plans for commits before they sign national letters of intent? Can they advise them on things they should be working on, techniques, etc.? Um, unless the rules have changed, and they very well could have, 
um, since I played, obviously. When you are signed, absolutely. They can they can provide detailed information, weightlifting, dietitian programs, all that and more. If you're a commit, I don't think that they're allowed to give you anything yet. But if you are signed, and I guess the question is for you, since you said before they signed an LOI, I guess the answer would be no. But say you sign in December and you don't enroll until June, they can hand you out plans for sure. I'll double check on that, but I'm pretty sure they can't give you anything unless you are um, a, a signee, but I'll double check on that. Mr. Jones, 6696, what do you think the realistic odds are that Nico uh, being a Heisman finalist or a Heisman winner this year? Then he puts in all caps, Tennessee won the first BC, first ever BCS National Championship. Tennessee can win the first ever 12-team playoff. Yeah, I mean, I think Tennessee's talented enough to win this championship, but you still got to go out and win football games. Like, I mean, I was talking with somebody on the general's quarters the other day. Do I think Tennessee is talented enough to win the title? Sure. If every single thing goes right on every single snap of every single game, nobody gets hurt, any team can win the national championship. I do think Tennessee's got a lot of talent, though, no doubt. Um, you still got to go out there and play the games and, and, and you know, see what it looks like week in and week out. I'm not calling a national championship. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think Tennessee's certainly talented enough. Now, as far as Nico and the Heisman odds, in my personal opinion, I think everybody should pump the brakes on that. But I will say this, if Tennessee is making the college football playoff, if Tennessee's going a couple of rounds in the college football playoff, then Nico is playing like a Heisman winner for sure. So depending on how Tennessee season goes, and I know Jaden Daniels won the Heisman last year and they won nine games. I get that. Um, but the better Tennessee is, the better Nico is playing, in my opinion. So um, I, I think winning the Heisman, you know, Heisman finalists, there's got to be four there. Think of how great Hendon Hooker was in 2022. And he still wasn't a finalist because favoritism went with Stetson Bennett, which was just an embarrassing joke. And I can't believe that even happened. I just so sorry. It was so sorry. I'm not saying Stetson Bennett, I'm not trying to attack him personally. But when you're looking at <laughs> college football players that year, there was no reason that Stetson Bennett should have been a Heisman finalist over Hendon Hooker. Hendon still wouldn't have won it, though, so I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, but think of how good he was, and he wasn't even a finalist that year. So I don't know. I mean, I, I would pump the brakes a little bit, but is he talented enough? Absolutely. And the more Tennessee is in terms of better and the more games they win, the more he's going to be in position. So um, you know, we'll see. I'm excited to see you know what, what that can look like. Louisiana Vol asks, if Boost starts at the star position, who do we have in the kick, kick and punt return game? I think even if he starts, he's still returning punts, in my opinion. I think he is the punt returner for Tennessee. Uh, Squirrel Wide is also an option. It's my understanding that the plan was for Boo to at least take back kicks, if nothing else, but now with him needing to step up early and the depth that we have, will he get pulled off returns? I, I don't think uh, Boo, what he does on defense, will affect what he does in special teams, in my opinion. Also, Tennessee doesn't return kicks hardly ever since Valus Jones kicks. Now, punt's a different story. Uh, kicks they don't return. I got a couple to run through here on the uh, on the Twitter. Viva Laval says, after everything you've heard from the scrimmage, has it made you rethink any games for the schedule? Um, our D-line looking good enough to feel confident going up against OU and UF, weaker offensive line. I like Tennessee's defensive line against any offensive line that they're going to play. Sure, Alabama's offensive line is going to be good, and Georgia's offensive line is going to be good, and there's going to be good offensive lines out there. I recognize that, but I'll take Tennessee's defensive line over almost anybody. So absolutely, do I think a key to the game, Tennessee on the road at Oklahoma, Tennessee's defensive line that literally goes 13 deep of men who are experienced, who have played a lot of football, compared against a brand new offensive line behind in front of Jackson Arnold in Oklahoma? Yeah, give me advantage, Tennessee. But to answer your question, Anything I've heard from the scrimmage, give me, watch on YouTube, my light just went out, give me any reason to change my win-loss total on the on the schedule. I'll do my official win-loss total um, you know, a couple of weeks here before the season starts, but the answer is no. Nothing about the scrimmage the other day has me thinking I should change my win-loss total for Tennessee. Let's go to Deuce. The Vols defense was ranked 33rd overall in 2023. Total defense, 335 yards per game. Sixth overall in tackles for loss at 101. Ninth in sacks, 13. They had more than 13, that is for sure. Um, given the additions slash departures, do you think those numbers improve, get worse, or stay about the same? Tennessee's been great in the tackles for loss category since 
this regime's been here. 101's a ton, but give me more TFLs. I'll take the over there, which is really, really good. Um, the sacks aren't in front of me. The number here is wrong. But give me more sacks uh, because I just think that there's a bigger body to get it from. He, James Pierce might not have as many as he had last year. I hope that he does. But I think there's going to be more people involved in that realm this year. And then total defense, the overall defense, yeah, give me more. I think they'll be better than 33rd overall. Will they take as big of a jump as they did from one year to the next and pass defense from 2022 to 2023? I don't know if they will, but I think the overall defense will be better. Um, Matthew Osborne says, star bench cut. Derek Dooley, Butch Jones, Jeremy Pruitt. Well, the start is clear as day. It's Butch Jones. I know everybody likes to make fun of him, but of that trio, let's look at the guy that actually won games at Tennessee for a couple of years. That's Butch Jones. He can recruit. He won games. He couldn't develop, but the start is easy. It's Butch Jones. The bench and the cut is very, very challenging um, because I think I think Jeremy Pruitt is a much better coach than Derek Dooley. Now, head coach is a different story. Jeremy Pruitt was in over his head. He couldn't manage this program, in my opinion. Um, not like Derek Dooley did a good job either. There was one year where he didn't recruit any offensive linemen, which is just ridiculous. As far as football coach, the game of football, it's it starred Jeremy Pruitt over these three. But as far as head coaches, <laughs> I guess the way it ended, you can't not cut Jeremy Pruitt. So you start Butch Jones, that's easy. You bench, I guess, Derek Dooley, and you cut Jeremy Pruitt. Um, last one right here is from Aaron. Hey, Eric, do you think that a healthy JG with Heupel as his head coach could have been a dynamic playmaker like Hendo Cinco? He had lots of talent, but between injuries, coaching changes, and poor protection, didn't really live up to expectations. Good question. We'll never know. One, because it didn't happen. He didn't play for this coaching staff. Number two, he was broken after his retro freshman year. He was broken. I mean, he, he, he really was like he, he, his body was never the same after getting a taste of the action as a red shirt freshman. Um, I'm glad you brought up coaching changes because obviously there was coaching changes there, but also he, I think there was some incredible stat. I'll have to go look it up in his five years here. He had four different offensive coordinators, which is just incredible and not in a good way. So he didn't have any protection. His body was broken. He had no sp stability in terms of coaches. Everybody hates on JG. <laughs> he never had a chance, in my opinion. Do I think he would have been like Hendo Cinco in this offense with this staff? I don't know. Probably not. Because Hendon Hooker, I saw with my own eyes. It was incredible. Um, but I do think JG in this system with health would have been so much better. I think JG would have flourished in this system. No doubt about it. But... Again, we will never know. Would he be as good as Hendon the Hooker? I'll say no, because Hendon Hooker, in my opinion, was one of the four best players in all of college football in 2022, as I said earlier. All right, that is going to do it here for this edition of Locked On Balls. Can't thank you guys enough for uh, making this a part of your show, making Locked On Balls your first listen, your first watch. Check out Locked On College Football, Locked On SEC. Make that your second listen here today. We'll come back with a little Josh Ward Ward Wednesday tomorrow and the latest from Tennessee Fall Football Camp. Plenty more to talk about before kickoff gets here in two and a half weeks. Appreciate you guys as always. This is Locked on Balls.